Welcome every day, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. It is a nice, cool fall day here. We love it. Um, finally getting some cooler weather to break off this Texas heat. Um, and we are welcoming you to an overview of our College Station Master's program. So I'm going to be covering quite a few, uh, few of these slides. And I'm going to be doing that with another colleague, uh, which I'll introduce in just a second. So Today, this is going to be a presentation that'll cover quite a bit of material. Some of it, if you've attended some of our other webinars, might be a repeat. We try to keep this one fairly general and then hit into some additional details on those specific webinars, like with aid or maybe specifically with career services. So today, I'm going to keep moving pretty quickly. I've got the chat section up on my computer so that if you do have questions for us, please just be sure to drop those in and I'll try to address them as I can. So to get started, the presenters today, my name is Katherine Meyer. I'm the Director of Graduate Admissions and Recruitment, and I'll be leading the charge today, talking about most of the slides, and then joining me about 20 to 30 minutes in will be Matt Upton. He's our Assistant Dean of Career and Student Services, and he'll be covering specifically some of the resources that we have for our students, and then some of the career paths and how we support them in getting to those uh, next steps for employment. So that agenda today I'm going to cover, I'm going to start with our location and the types of degrees that we offer in each of those locations. Specifically, we're going to talk about the graduate academic programs. Um, I'm going to primarily concentrate on the College Station Texas options, and then I'm going to cover some of the admission statistics and uh, processes. And then we'll cover a little bit about the funding and costs. And then Matt will come in and talk about professional development and career services. And then I will stop the recording and we'll start taking some of the questions and answers. So I'm going to start with basically an overview of what is the Bush School of Government and Public Service here at Texas A&M. We were, um, when we started, just a graduate school only. And a couple of years ago, we were shifted to combine with political science and international studies, and we inherited some undergraduate programs. So now we house both undergrad programs and graduate programs um, here at Texas A&M and College Station. We did open our doors in 1997, so we just celebrated our 25th anniversary. We have roughly 2,800 alumni from our master's program. But I'll mention this later, we have the huge Aggie network of, I don't know, 500,000 that we can play with and connect with and help students find jobs, um, move forward in their careers. So that is always a huge bonus for our students in being able to network with a university of our size. So the master's degrees that we're going to cover, there's five of them in College Station. I'll primarily focus on two of them. We do have two programs in Washington, D.C. that I'll briefly touch on. And there is one executive program that is available online. Um, students still do have to come here to College Station for a couple of weeks to take care of some materials, but the rest of that is completed through those online um, options. There are also six graduate certificates um, online and on campus that I will cover in a later slide. It, and essentially, when you're trying to talk about how do we look compared to other programs, we're preparing students for careers um, that they're going to have for the rest of their professional work, right? So this is a, what we call a terminal degree. Most are coming here and then they're going into the workforce. There may be a few that head on to get a JD or maybe an continue on for a PhD, but by and large, most are coming here and then going to work in any number of these career fields. Uh, federal, state, local government's a big one, nonprofits, sometimes the international NGOs, any number of agencies, think tanks that deal with education, environmental health security issues, um, sometimes government contracting. They're doing more and more of that. And Matt will talk about later. And of course, the private industry is still a viable option too. Um, but we're known for that public service element that's built into our name. So a lot of our students do go into public service. Our locations, uh, we are on two areas, right? Main campus in College Station, Texas. 
this is home of Texas A&M University. This is the one when you Google it, that's going to come up. And the great thing about College Station is it is a little bit of a smaller town. The next slide will show you some elements of that. Um, but <clears throat> we're centrally located to four major metropolitan areas. So it is easy to get to Houston and Austin, which are about an hour and a half away. Dallas, Fort Worth and San Antonio um, are about three hours away. So you can get to those locations. Again, networking plays a part in that, um, being able to connect with your uh, former classmates and colleagues uh, and being able to continue those relationships. And a lot of them will try to come back here at different times of their uh, career paths and just retouch with some of the faculty and the staff that they got to know here. Um, and we're easy to get to for that. Now that we did open a branch campus several years ago, it is located in Washington, DC, a couple of blocks from the White House. So you're able to either get off the Farragut North or West um, and walk to it. So it's very easy. It's nice to have that location, uh, especially for students that might want to spend a semester there and come back. Uh, but this is a, a unique thing is that it's geared towards working professionals. Um, so there's evening classes in that D.C. location, whereas the College Station campus is usually full-time students taking classes during the day. Um, they're not trying to balance both like they might be in Washington, D.C. So here on uh, the College Station campus, we are part of the Bush Presidential Library Center area. So you can see from this picture, the main campus is in the far uh, section, and you can see we've got intramural fields and other elements kind of separating us from main campus. There is a bus that runs the route. So people are taking classes elsewhere on campus, they can do that. Um, but our building is the Allen building, it's the back building. Um, in front of that is the Presidential Conference Center and the Bush Foundation is housed there. Lots of guest speakers, conferences are held in that area. And then the George Presidential, um, George Bush Presidential Library and Museum is right next to that. So it makes for a great, um, separation from main campus, we are able to kind of focus in on those professional elements of bringing in speakers and um, maybe dressing a little nicer than what happens on main campus. And so it gives people a sense of um, collegiality of seeing each other and interacting with each other kind of away from the hum drum of all campus and all that is going on, um, especially on game <laughs> on game weekends. So the community and the rankings, uh, the Brazos Valley consists of two cities, Bryan and College Station. So Texas A&M is housed here in College Station. When you combine those two sister cities together, we have a population of just over 200,000. So it gives enough variety that people can get involved and do elements outside of Texas A&M when they want to. They can also get in their car and drive to some of the bigger cities with concerts and activities. So we're consistently ranked high in economic and social categories for economy, quality of life, growth, and retirement. Um, one of the top 50 best places to live in the U.S. Uh, on average. So there's just a lot going on here. But one of the draws is Texas A&M University. So some of the alumni who graduate and then come back, um, they're able to go to all the sporting events and reconnect with their university in such a way that other schools don't have. So we do have over 74,000 students here um, within the College Station area. Now, about 15,000 of those students are graduate students. We are the smallest school with about 400 of those as the graduate students. Now, we're a bit, little bit bigger now that we'll count some of the PhD, but PhD program um, only does um, probably about 40 to 45 students a year. So they don't count a whole lot like our 80 to 90 that we're bringing in. And as far as the Bush School rankings, I'm just going to focus on the U.S. News and World Report because I didn't have a lot of space here. Um, but when you talk about the Public Service Administration and the International Affairs, International Affairs is not ranked. So we're pulled for the best public affairs programs and we're tied in the nation for number 28. Um, if you look at Homeland Security, that's one of our top ones. That's number eight. Um, a lot of that is kind of pulling from the strength of the security that we're also doing in the MIA. But public management and leadership is number 23, nonprofit 27, and public policy analysis number 34. And you can do both of those here, which we'll cover when we get to that program. So the academic overview, just to give a, a, a brief picture of this, bachelor's degree is political science and international affairs. So you will see students wandering around this building. They are taking classes in um, this area and down on the first floor. And 
And many of them may then decide to apply to the Bush School uh, for their master's degrees. So the master's degrees, the two that I highlighted there in that maroon color, public service and administration, that is bringing in about 85 to 90 students a year um, on a healthy year. We also have a couple of collaborative PhD programs that students who start here may want to go ahead and continue on um, for research in education and health policy issues. And in that case, they can apply for those programs and do these seven-year programs. But that's in addition to just the regular two-year Master of Public Service Administration. International Affairs, also a two-year program, and it exists. Um, additionally, there's some three-year programs that we call combined that are with public health and economics. So I'll have more on another slide later. There's an executive style program. This is a one-year international policy. It is offered both here in Texas and in Washington, D.C., but it is a little more limited in enrollment because you have to have four years of professional experience, um, especially tied to international affairs. And so that's a very small program. Now in Washington, DC, they also have a program called National Security and Intelligence. I don't specifically work with that program, but certainly we can get you in touch with them. And I have them on the last slide if you need to reach out to Jackie and her team um, in Washington, DC to take their uh, courses. And then again, we mentioned the Executive Master of Public Service and Administration is our online degree. So I'll have a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And then finally, for those that are looking at PhD, there is a political science program uh, that does offer some funding, um, but they're run through the political science department. So I don't cover anything about their programs. You will have to reach out directly to Amy Wynn in the poli sci department, which you can find her information on the website under their section. The last part of this is the graduate certificates. And they are online or in Texas. Um, so it just depends on what's being offered when. Now, uh, DC also has the Advanced International Affairs, so there's three ways you can take that one. But we also offer these um, graduate certificates. They're worth uh, four to five classes in to complete them. Sometimes people will use these graduate certificates as an off uh, timeline way of getting started. So let's say they graduate in December or they find out about our programs after the uh, deadlines have passed, they can maybe start these programs online or in person and go ahead and take some courses that will then be also counted towards the master's degrees if they are uh, accepted into those. So it's a great way for people maybe to start off cycle or to test out the classes or maybe that's all they want. Maybe they don't want a graduate degree. Maybe they already have one. And this is a way to get some professional development um, and expertise for maybe the, a new area of work that they're doing. So that's in geospatial intelligence, national security, public management, nonprofit, homeland, and advanced international affairs. Our Office of Extended Ed runs that program, and I'll give you their information at the end as well. Okay, so let's focus on the Master of Public Service Administration for just a few minutes. So the Master of Public Service is a two-year, 48-credit-hour program. You're going to be required for an internship and a one-year capstone working for a client. Now, you're not responsible for finding that client. That is what the faculty will do. So they're going to go find um, different clients. Some of the employers that we use will come back and say, hey, I'd really like your students to do some consulting work for me on this project. Our agency is really looking at doing such and such. And if you guys can do some groundwork for that and get it established, that would be great. So our students are then assigned whatever the scope of consulting work is. They will be in groups of five to 10 students and report back out to that client at the end of the year for this type of uh, research. So that one, I'll have a little more detail on some samples of that in a minute. The PhD collaborative degree I mentioned before is for those that want to go on and do additional research with education and public health. And as I mentioned, you can transfer up to 12 credit hours from a Bush School graduate certificate. So you're not losing those hours. You can get more than just the certificate. You can also count them towards this. So maybe if you come in with four courses, instead of you having to do 12 hours fall, 12 hours spring, maybe you're doing nine hours fall and nine hours spring because you're already ahead with those four credit hours already been taken. Um, I said four, four courses, 12 credit hours already taken. 
Now, if you decide that there are some courses that are being offered online that sound very interesting to you, and maybe they're not offered in person, you will have a right to take those classes and sign up for them. Just know because online has a different set of fees, that's going to add an additional cost of $1,500 per class that you take. And all your core courses have to be taken here on campus. Because we have that additional executive master of public service administration that exists within the same department as this one here in person, um, you can take a mix of online classes and in-person classes. So it gives a little bit more flexibility uh, for students who want to mix and match that. Just know that whichever one you apply to has to be the dominant program. So 51% of your classes have to be in that modality. So if you did it in person, then that means at least, because we do 16 classes, nine out of your 16 classes have to be in person, but another seven could be online. But again, you're gonna pay that higher price to do that. So we'll work with you through the department if that is something of interest to you. But when you're taking our classes, keep in mind, you've got what are called tracks and concentration. Tracks are in public management, public policy analysis and nonprofit. And that you will have to choose at least one. Sometimes people will choose more than one and that's okay too, because the concentrations are completely elective. You can choose an area of focus, you can design your own area of focus. You can move over and maybe do a focus from the MIA program, um, or you can pick one of these. And to fulfill a concentration, you're essentially taking at least three courses of all those that are listed to fulfill that. And you are gaining a little bit of a specialty in a certain area. So those that really like quantitative methods and math and analysis and want to crunch numbers, then sometimes analytical methods really speaks to you and you can take a whole slew of courses under that heading. Um, but if not, then you're okay just to stay with public policy analysis and just do courses under the tracks. So lots of flexibility in how we put together these programs because you are in control of your degree plan working with your faculty advisor. On the Master of International Affairs side of the house, this is also a two year 48 credit hour degree but now you have 11 electives to customize. So it's gonna also the same that you're gonna be required for an internship, but they give you an additional opportunity to do a language immersion because you have to be able to pass a foreign language uh, at the speaking ability. So we're going to give you an option to choose which one. Most usually try to go the route of the internship to get their foot in the door with certain agencies. But if they have not had time to work on their foreign language like they had hoped, maybe going to France and working on their French or going to Costa Rica for their Spanish gives them a little more time to focus on that. So when they come back, they can pass that exam. So we leave that up to you. So this does require passing that foreign language test to graduate. If you don't pass that test, you will get an empty tube at graduation. So it's important that you meet that requirement. If we have international students where English is their second language, then they're already exempt because you already have a foreign language. So keep in mind that they're also required to do this uh, capstone project, but it is only a semester long for the MIA. So a little more intense, a little more uh, maybe scaled down in the scope of the work that a client wants done, but it is a semester long, typically in your last semester. They also have combined degrees. They've got a couple of three-year degrees where students will start with public health or with economics, and then they will then come to us and finish the program. So in the example of public health, they do the first year and a half with them, and they do the last year and a half with our MIA, and they would have applied to both programs and gotten acceptances from both. So a little bit unique, there's a handful of students who go into those programs each year, um, but we've got everything outlined on the website for what you should do to follow that and to find out more. Same idea, they can also transfer up to 12 credit hours from one of the certificates. In this case, we focus uniquely on CAIA and CHLS, that International Affairs and Homeland Security just mesh better with our programs. That's not to say that someone couldn't do a Homeland Security, uh, sorry, a, a nonprofit management or a public management but you would really need to find out permissions to do that because they don't typically go with our concentrations. So in this case, tracks are required. It's one of those two, national security, diplomacy, 
or international development and economic policy. And you will need to know which one you want to pursue at the time that you're applying. And then the concentrations, you are required to do two of them. So one will have to be tied to your track and they're separated on the website of which ones go with what. And then your second concentration can be any of them. So let's say that you are doing international development and economic policy. You could um, end up picking something like foreign economic policy. And then your second one could be cybersecurity if you wanted to, or Latin America, or conflict and development. You get a wide range of this. You won't see individually designed concentrations here, but sometimes people do put ones together. It's just not as common as it is for the Master of Public Service. So yes, if you don't see what you're looking for, like some people wanting to do nuclear non-proliferation, um, in that case, they could work with um, the engineering, nuclear engineering here at AM and put that together. So that is quite uh, freely an option here. Now, I've already uh, talked about these combined degrees, but just remember, you are applying to both departments simultaneously. And when you're given our admissions through our programs, remember, our Bushville scholarship is only going to apply when you're enrolled with us full time. So if you need additional funding, you're going to have to find out, does public health do that? Does economics do that? Because you're going to start with their programs and see what kind of funding they have. So everything is on the website. These are, um, again, two degrees for three years of work. Both are fairly new. So not a whole lot of students have gone through those yet. The one year Master of International Policy, just to kind of highlight this, you must have four years of professional international experience. Don't apply for that program without it. It is not a, a waivable kind of requirement. And then you'll lose your uh, application fee because you're not um, for, yeah, supplied for it, right? So you've got to be able to make sure, ask the questions ahead of time. This is a very small program. It was originally intended for those that are coming in from the military who need to be in and out in one year to get back to service. But we have had a few students who have come um, with enough of a background through work um, who can qualify and get out in one year. Not as many international students do because we do not do funding for this program. So if you apply to this program for one year, you're on your own for all in-state and out-of-state fees. There's no way to waive those here. So this is a one year, 30 credit hour degree. It is a rolling admission. So we start students in the fall, spring or summer. You can take online courses, but remember it's gonna cost you $1,500 more to do that. There is no internship requirement, no capstone requirement and no foreign language re requirement. So that speaks well of just trying to streamline the program and get people in and out. But remember, no Bush school funding either. So you can qualify for federal aid, military benefits. If you have sponsorship outside funding, that might work for you. Uh, but for the most part, this is usually domestic students. Uh, the DC campus, they do have evening courses for their professionals and MIP is offered in both locations. Now for the tracks, you can only get the national security and diplomacy for both of these um, in DC and in Texas. But if you're really looking at international development, you have to come to Texas for it because it is not offered in DC. Uh, the, those that in Texas, you'll, you're gonna choose from those same MIA concentrations I just discussed in the slide before. The DC, you're gonna choose the NSD track and they've got a couple of concentrations you can choose from, including things like intelligence and Russia and some other areas, but they're all listed on the website when you need it. Okay, we're gonna transition real quick to application requirements. So the priority funding deadline is December 15th. That's when we would like you to apply for that following fall start. So this is the Master of Public Service, Master of International Affairs and the combined degrees. Now the final deadline you have until January 12th for the Master of Public Service and International Affairs, you have until February 1st for the combined degrees. What we need from you is the application and fee and we do not waive the fees. I know a lot of people ask for them. I've already seen two of you on here who are asking for them. We do not provide them because I can't waive them. I have to pay for them. And we don't use our funding for that except for those that we have agreements with. 
So students have to pay that hundred and whatever fee that is. I think I've got listed on the other one. Um, I think it's $119. I, I can't waive it. It's just not something standard that A&M does. Um, it's great if you can get it from other schools. Uh, we just are not able to reciprocate that. Um, you are going to need unofficial transcripts at the time that you apply. You will need three recommendations, a resume, a personal statement. If you're applying for the MIA, you also need your international experience essay and your proof of English proficiency. And that can be done in any number of ways, some just based off the school that you went to, sometimes based off TOEFL or IELTS. So you just work with that and we'll help you with that. And it's all on the website for uh, ways to do that. And then the GRE is optional. So if you are encouraged to do it, if your GPA is below a 3.2, if you really feel like it's a strength for you and can help, um, we also ask that you do it. So it's a $210 test for most applicants. Um, not everybody wants to do it. So we're seeing more and more people opting out. That is your call. There's no pressure for you to do that. Um, faculty are understanding that fewer and fewer are wanting to spend the time and the effort to take that test. Now, if you're coming in for the MIP degree, it's a little bit differently because you've got rolling deadlines. So pay attention for fall, for instance, you have until April to make that decision. If you were to do that for MPSA, you're too late. So pay attention to that. They have the same requirements, except that you only have two recommendations. And again, you don't have to do the international experience essay. So the rest of that is exactly the same. The process and timeline that December 15th, we push that because it's a priority for us to be able to have time over the holiday to get those ready for faculty review. In mid January to early February, we start contacting everyone that we've moved forward, or you would at that time start hearing that you have not moved forward and either are declined or we're still waiting on some materials that you haven't submitted. But we need all of February to take care of interviews. So we are interviewing all of our candidates. And you have until those final deadlines to get that into us, be conducted two interviews with faculty and or staff. And then in March, we come back together sometime within the March 1st through 10th to work as a committee to go through who's admitted and who's on wait list and who is not and to offer scholarship funding for you. You have until April 15th to get back to us if you accept or decline our offer. So again, when you receive your offer from us in March, it's not only just the decision, it's also the financial aid decision. And that's all put together. So you don't have to wait and go, well, I was admitted, but can I afford it? You're gonna be able to tell that as soon as you get your letter. Now, if you're looking at the MIP, those decisions are done a, a more on a rolling basis. So that it takes seven to 10 business days and we wish to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. MIP candidates don't have to interview. Uh, they already have the experiences. We really like having them here. So we try to streamline that one a little bit more. Everything for the admissions is on the website. Follow it by the program that you are applying to. And that's bush.tamu.edu admissions degrees. All right, now, as far as the stats, what do we look like? And then I'm gonna roll this over to Matt pretty quickly. We have competitive enrollment. So the incoming fall 23 class, the Master of Public Service brought in, I believe right around 75 students. Their GPA was a 3.44. You can see our average age, how many females, underrepresented under groups, international students, and the non-residents. The work experience, typically we have a few more older students coming into this program uh, year in and year out. And then if you're looking at the Master of International Affairs, their GPA was kind of on par where MPSA was last year, which it just dropped a little bit, but they were 3.63 this year. Usually a little bit younger group. Um, they had a few more males than females. Uh, underrepresented group was still strong here. There were 36% in the MPSA it was 25%. International students, not as quite as many as we have for the Master of Public Service. Um, that's usually self-selection. Students sometimes can't afford to come here or they're just not able to get their paperwork. Um, and again, we have non-residents is a little bit more in the MIA. Texas tends to come, be the stronger applicant pool in the MPSA. Work experience, you can see they're a little bit younger for that. 
So merit and your experience and fit do affect your scholarship level. So keeping strong grades, going to a good school, um, if you can combine that with some work experience, that may just help grab you up to the higher level. So small school environment, we're enrolling 80 to 90 students per department. You guys sit in classes that average about 16. Most classes max out at 20 to 25. So these are going to be where you're not gonna be able to hide in the back. You're going to have all these discussions and you're expected to come in and be prepared for class. And you're going to learn from seasoned practitioners who've been out there in the field, either as diplomats, intelligence agencies, people who have run nonprofits, those who are working in the government job and sectors and coming back and teaching what they know. And then obviously, as every program, you've got those expert professors and academics who are in their in their field doing a lot of cutting edge research. Now, here's where a lot of you really want to know with this uh, scholarships and funding. In year one, when you are looking at the Master of Public Service and the Master of International Affairs, our two flagship, everyone is covered with some level of scholarship. And if you are from out of state of Texas, you are also going to get a non-resident tuition waiver. So that alone is worth about $12,700. And then your scholarship is going to range between $1,000 up to $29,000. Now, most of those are what we call Bush School Scholarship, and they're more of the 3,000 to 15,000. But I will warn you, two thirds of our students do get that three to 5,000. It's how we cover more students. So if you're wanting that higher level of 10 or 15K to help cover your tuition and fees, you're just gonna have to be the strongest of the strong who apply that year. And we won't know that until we get that applicant pool together. So when people email me and say, hey, what are you, my chances of being admitted? Well, the, being admitted is one thing, it's affording it as another. And so that's two conversations to have. Um, in the summer, you can qualify for funding if you get an internship that is not paid. Um, and you'll get some additional instructions from Matt on that. And in year two, your scholarship renews. So if you came in with a $5,000 scholarship, as long as you keep your GPA above a 3.25, you'll be renewed at that same $5,000. Or in your second year, you'll be given that opportunity to compete for a graduate assistantship. There's only about a dozen of these per department. And there's a few additional outside of that. Uh, but if you do become a Gantt, non-teaching, or a GAR research, then you would instead give up the scholarship and you replace it with that work stipend. And that stipend typically equates to around a $20,000 scholarship. Um, so it's a nice substitution if you can get it. But that is not an option in year one. In year one, you're strictly on scholarship. So we encourage our students to look to see what kind of jobs they can find, um, other positions around campus um, through a program called Jobs for Aggies. And if you're an international student, sometimes your visa may allow for some of that. Um, but sometimes we also have faculty who are working on research and you might be able to work for them. But none of that's guaranteed in order for you to fill out your forms when getting here. So it does become a, a cost issue. So estimated tuition and required fees before our scholarship and waiver, if you're a non-resident, you're looking at around $26,450. International, we rounded that up to about $30,000 because the insurance costs about $4,000. So we've rounded that off. So what you're needing is a scholarship of that 10 to 15,000. That's the highest you can go for an international student. And from there, you're also gonna get the waiver. So most of our students typically are somewhere between 8,000 and about 12,000 in costs that they have to cover each year, um, just in the tuition and fees. And then you've got living costs to, to work with too. Uh, MIP, those totals are there as well. And you see they're just a little bit more expensive. And then I'm gonna pass this off and then I'm gonna look at some of the questions and I'll come back to you and answer some of those before I sign off. But Matt Upton, I'm going to pass it to you and let you present for just a few minutes. Thank you. Great, thanks, Catherine. Um, I was here um, on the screen, just had my camera off there, but uh, I'm glad to be here today. As Catherine said, my name is Matt Upton. Um, I am the Assistant Dean for Graduate Career and Student Services. Um, and so I've worked here for the past 20 years, helping students in career advising and some other areas. So obviously graduate school is a lot different than undergrad. And so we're thinking professionally, how do we help these individuals who are coming into our programs 
develop and prepare for their careers moving forward. And we know that that's why most of you are coming to graduate school. And so we want to do everything we can to help you with that. So we do have a public service leadership program that Holly Kasperbauer runs. Um, in that program, you're going to participate in things like strengths and Myers-Briggs type indicator to learn about yourself. And then also um, she hosts workshops on how to utilize what you know about yourself from a personality standpoint, from a strengths standpoint, and how does that apply to group projects? How does that apply to your professional career moving forward? Uh, we also have a couple of staff members who work with our students um, to improve their writing. Now, they're not gonna edit your papers for you. They're not gonna tell you what to write, but they are going to help you become a better writer. Um, and they have workshops and training that they offer to you uh, that you can participate in. Um, being part of a presidential library complex and being a robust school with a number of um, institutes and research centers and, uh, and research programs, we do offer a number of speakers and conferences throughout the year that you can participate in. And those are opportunities. They're always looking for our graduate students to participate in that. And so they're always going to have uh, chances for you to be involved in that. Um, in addition to the presidential library, we also have a world-class um, library here at Texas A&M University. We have extensive digital and library collections um, and also have an interlibrary program and document delivery that we function and work with uh, other universities across the nation. Um, internationally, if you want to gain some additional experience, we do have some study abroad trips, typically one or two of those per year that you can go on. We do have some reciprocal exchange programs with universities in South Korea, in Wales, and in Germany. And then we also have the capstone project that Catherine mentioned earlier will sometimes involve international travel, depending on who your client is. It can also include travel to places outside of Texas or places within the state of Texas. So we've had students travel regularly every year. We have students who go to Washington, D.C. to present to their client. We also have students go to Houston and Austin and Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, and then also internationally, we've had a group go down to Mexico the last two years for a nonprofit that we've done capstone projects with in the last years. Um, as Catherine mentioned earlier, there is a language requirement for the International Affairs Program. And so we encourage you, if you aren't quite confident enough in your language, uh, your foreign language uh, proficiency, we do encourage you consider that as an option instead of an internship or in addition to an internship. Some of our students will go and do a shorter language immersion right before the summer starts or right at the end of the summer. Regardless, we encourage you to come back and take that language exam so you can pass. As Catherine mentioned, if you pass all of your classes, even if you have a 4.0, you have straight A's and everything, but you don't pass that language exam in the International Affairs Program, then you won't get your degree and we don't want that to happen. We also offer other support resources like Rosetta Stone, online Rosetta Stone resources, in-person language practice groups with tutors, um, and then again, the language immersions that you can participate in. As I mentioned earlier, when I talked about speakers and conferences, we also have a number of research centers and institutes that offer a variety of opportunities from international trade to nonprofit management and international NGOs to women, peace and security, to economics and economic statecraft. So a number of great, great resources for you for professional development. We also have a number of student organizations that you can get involved with that are specific to the Bush School. Now, Texas A&M University is a, is a pretty big campus. We have 77,000 students this fall, which sounds enormous, um, and it is for those of us that have been here for a while, but the Bush School as a graduate program, our graduate programs that we're talking about today, um, still has a very small feel to it. And so you have opportunities to be involved in some student organizations that are specific to the Bush School, like a public, our public service organization, or our graduate student government association that has committees for social events and traditions like tailgating before the AM football games, international connections, fundraising and merchandising like Bush School merchandise, um, a tailgate committee, as I mentioned, a green committee, a graduation. We also have a student chapter of the International City and County Management Association, a student chapter of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Uh, we have a foreign language and culture society. They are part of that process of helping you become proficient in your language, uh, but they also host other cultural events as well. We have an ambassador's council. They serve as the official hosts 
for Bush School events at those research um, centers and conferences uh, that we talked about on the previous slide. Plus, there are a thousand or more student organizations at Texas A&M that you can get involved with, plus a very robust community involved in public service that you can be involved with. So let's get to, uh, to the most important part here, <laughs> which is most people come to graduate school to improve your career options down the road. And so how do we do that? Well, we've talked about some of the professional development resources. We also have a staff. We have three staff members, myself and two other uh, staff members. One, Ashley Winter Road, who focuses on career programming, things like career workshops. How do you put together an effective resume? How do you network effectively or interview um, accurately and in a way that's going to help you get a job or an internship? We have a series of five career workshops that we ask you to attend, that we require you to attend at the beginning of your first year. If you attend all of those and you complete the, um, the uh, assignments that are given in those workshops, like putting together a resume and a LinkedIn profile, amongst other things, then you do qualify for internship funding if your internship or language immersion is unpaid. Um, and that's in addition to the funding that Catherine talked about earlier. We also have Michael Cochran, who's our uh, uh, staff member who focuses on employee outreach, employer outreach. And so he's the one who interfaces with employers who want to recruit our Bush School students for jobs and internships. He also manages our online career management system where we post jobs and internships and resources for that job search. You can see from the employment statistics for the last couple of years in the public administration program, typically our top employers are state, local, nonprofit, and federal government. Um, and then in the international affairs program, you see a lot bigger number in that federal group. And if you look at the government contractor group, that should also be included in the federal number. We separate them out because government contractors are private sector employers. Uh, but most of the time they are working on a federal government contractor. So you can see in 2022, 45% of that class was working in the federal government. And then if you look for the class of 2021, 46% were working in the federal government arena. Um, nonprofit work kind of ebbs and flows in international affairs. And we are seeing a little bit of an uptick in state and really in state government work for our international affairs um, students. So all of this information is up on our website, and this is based on um, response rates of 85 to 95 percent of our students or our graduates are responding. So you're, you're looking at majority of our graduates are telling us what they're doing afterwards, and they're very successful in the things that they do. There's more information on the website, including some of the specific locations or organizations and then we'll talk about here. Um, you can see the federal government, as you might expect, with a focus on national security and diplomacy. We've got a number of graduates who go to work in the intelligence community, um, from the CIA to the Defense Intelligence Agency, FBI, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NCIS. Uh, we also have graduates who go to work for the State Department, Commerce, Defense, Justice, U.S. Go government Accountability Office, at the uh, state and local level, uh, the city of Austin and Houston, Harris County is the county that surrounds uh, the Houston, greater Houston area. Um, if you're not looking to stay in Texas, we also have graduates who go to, who've gone to work in Maryland, Utah, California, and although not listed here, um, Wyoming and other states outside of the state of Texas, and then a number of state agencies here within the state of Texas uh, that they could go to work for. Nonprofit organizations, you're going to see some that are going to be very familiar to you, like American Cancer Society um, or St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, maybe even Samaritan's Purse or United Way. And then also some that are very specific to the area that we're, that we're in, like the Brazos Valley Food Bank um, or the Greater Texas Foundation, which is a local educational foundation. And then private sector employers, everything from Accenture and Bank of America to Microsoft and MD Anderson Cancer Center down in Houston. So a wide range of private sector employers as well. I'll turn it back over to Catherine. Okay, Matt, before you leave, there was a question by one um, attendee who wanted a little bit more information about the kind of intelligence or security internships or kinds of networking opportunities that we can provide our students who are looking for that security intel sure. world. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, the CIA, DIA, FBI, NGA, um, NSA regularly recruit here for both jobs and internships. So there are plenty of opportunities for you to hear directly from the employers. Um, if they don't make a trip here, they are often doing an online session for us that's specific to the Bush School. They also recruit heavily in the College of Engineering and in the Business School here at Texas A&M University. So if for some reason you were to miss them here or they weren't to make a trip over here to the Bush School, there are opportunities for you to go see them when they're here for the Business and Engineering Career Fair, but they are usually over here. In addition to that, and I should have mentioned this, I usually do, it just slipped my mind today. When you meet with us, um, we provide a lot of our career resources, obviously in group settings in those career workshops. But when we can really help you the most is when you come see us individually, because then you can share with us the specific things that you're interested in, the specific experiences you have, and the things that you want to do to build experience through an internship or a language immersion. In doing that, it also get, lets us know who you are, and then we're a lot more comfortable helping network you with some of our former students. And that's one of the things we love doing is when you come into us and tell us what you're really interested in, I love to one, connect you with a second year student who maybe did an internship similar to what you're, what you're looking to do. And then the second thing we like to do is connect you with some of our former students who are doing that same kind of work. Let you learn from them what it's really like to work in the intelligence community. What are the things you need to be aware of? What are the things you need to be thinking of in the classes that you take and the concentrations? How do you spend your summer? Is it better to spend it doing a language immersion or something else? So hopefully that gives you the information you need. That gave me a lot of information, so thank you. Yeah. Um, I know there was another question before I start looking at more chats. Um, that was asking about that GRE. I had told you it is optional, um, which it is. And, and how competitive will taking the GRE make your application? That's hard to say. Um, because it is optional, it's obviously a piece that is not used as much for admission as it used to be. And so you can't punish people for not having it, but you can perhaps reward some who might have a strong GPA with a strong GRE with maybe better funding because they have additional credentials that are viable, they're merit-based, and maybe that helps a student move from a 5,000 to a seven or a 10. So is taking a $200, $210 test now worth your time and effort to take the test? Only you can decide that. I will say that one advantage of here and how we run ours is that if a student takes and reports that score and is not happy with it, they can reach out to us. I've got the Bush School Admissions address here, but there's another one called Bush School Applications at tamu.edu. And if you email Ashley that I'm not happy with my score, can you please pull it? She will not put it into the report that faculty see. So only our staff who are working all these materials would know what that score was. And we're not gonna put it forward to hurt you if you ask for it to be pulled. So it's up to you if you think it's the time and effort to do. We're finding more and more students are saying, I'm in the middle of finishing up my semesters as undergrad, I don't have time to take it. Is that gonna hurt me? No, it's not gonna hurt you. It, it's meant to help. So if you think that, the ability to do well on that test can help you maybe with funding more than admissions, then that's where you've got to decide, is it going to be worth my time? But even some of our highest scholarships, the, the biggest ones, sometimes they're given to people who don't have a GRE because so few people are doing it. So we're using our scores on the application reviews. We're using our interviews. We're using the admissions committee making comments about certain elements of a file or the resume, something that drew them out and went, man, this is the kind of student we really want here. Let's reward them. Um, they've got the merit. They've got the GPA. They went to a good school. Here's the things that justify being able to give this kind of scholarship. So we go through all of that in the uh, application process with the committee. Um, another question I had seen was just verifying about that GPA that I had given. So remember GPAs that I list for stats, it was a 3.44 for MPSA. 
is a 3.63, I believe, for MIA. That varies from year to year. Um, but we're looking for the best students to make up for that class um, that we feel people are a good fit for the program that we are preparing them for. So if that's the case, we want people to be able to come here. Um, it's self-selected at the time of, did you get enough funding to afford it? And that's the part we're trying to give as much as we can to students, but we don't come back after the fact and say, oh, you got a better offer from someone else, or, oh, you can't afford to come here. Oh, here's some need-based aid we didn't give you. We don't have that. We have merit-based aid only. So we rely a lot on the students to find their own funding, sometimes through websites like apsia.org, who has a lot of that. If you didn't catch that, it's apsia.org. They've got 134 different scholarships that students can apply for. Um, they're not all for domestic students. So it's just a matter of you applying to enough schools to figure out what makes sense for you who can get you onto that trajectory for the jobs that you want. And we are here to help in all ways possible. And I'm leaving up this uh, part with dropping in more chat questions. Please do contact us, Catherine and Ashley. Those are the two of us who work this Bush School admissions here in College Station. If you're looking for the online EMPSA or the graduate certificates, you reach out to the Office of Extended Education. If you are looking for our Washington, D.C. office location, then you reach out to Bush School, D.C. at TAMU. And I just want to remind you, the Bush School stands out for several reasons. And one of them is the great students that we have. But those great students are also supported by passionate faculty. These are people who know their stuff. They're helping prepare you in all ways possible with the skills and knowledge to get you to those next steps. You are choosing the different specialized concentrations of what you need. So you have say so in what your uh, degree plan looks like. So take advantage of that. You're going to have a collaborative environment, especially if you're here in College Station, you're building that peer cohort because you're in classes with them during the day. They're not just running in here, taking classes in the evening and running back out and you never really know them. You guys will serve on committees together. You'll do uh, community projects together, tailgating. Um, there's social activities. There's course projects that you're doing a lot of that group work. So you're really gonna get to know them well. And that speaks volumes for you know, being able to utilize those connections years down the road. You're also doing the consulting projects with those industry leaders through the capstones you are required to do some kind of professional internship or language immersion if you don't already have a number of years. If you do, you can get that waived. Um, but that's giving you additional tools for that tool belt, right, to help you get those jobs. And we are a huge university, a research university, vast resources, vast connections, um, and we're a best value. You really can't afford to come here. We're not 28,000 a semester. We're under usually around 18 for most of you. I think it's around 15 for most of you. And even then we've got scholarships to knock that cost down. So affordability is a huge thing. And you've got speakers and events and career and faculty advising. And uh, we're here to help and work with you every step of the way. And we hope we can be a part of that. So I'm not going to go anywhere yet. What I am going to do is go ahead and sign off and stop the recording. And thank you guys for coming. If anyone wants to stay on and continue to ask me questions at that time, I'll let you unmute and ask. And you can turn on your video if you choose to do that. And we'll just go from there. So thank you guys for joining us. I hope this uh, overview gives you a lot of information to think about. And then come back to us when you're ready.